Welcome everyone, my name's Sylph, and this is my attempt to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Heart Gold with only Rock-type Pokemon. The full rule set for this run is listed down below, but put simply, only the first Rock-type encounter in each route or area can be caught. If a Pokemon faints, it must be permanently boxed. No items except held items in battle. Party Pokemon levels are limited to the next Gym Leader or Elite Force Ace. And finally, the battle mode must be put on set at all times. As I'm sure you all know by now, Rock-types are very interesting. Yes, they can be really cool, and yes, the type itself is alright on the face of it, but the Pokemon that have the rock type tend not to be amazing. And this is because it's often paired with another type that gives it a 4 times weakness. I mean, there are so many rock types with 4 times weaknesses, it's unbelievable. Thankfully, Heart Gold and Soul Silver do give us a plethora of rock types to work with through this run, but there are some very crazy situations with a lot of these possible encounters that we'll get into as we progress. Now, with all that said, there is no doubt about it that rock types look cool as f. And if you want to look as cool as them, you'll love today's video sponsor, Kimaira. If you're looking for a Christmas or holiday present for others, or perhaps yourself, kimira has got you covered. They're an ethical and sustainable clothing brand that offers some incredibly unique designs and finds an amazing balance between quality, reasonable pricing, and fair labor, which is why I love them. Their clothing's all super comfortable and durable, being made from 100% ring-spun cotton at affordable prices too. Like $20 for their premium t-shirts, way cheaper than major brands, but of even better quality. You already know, on this channel we've got the gamers covered with video game based graphic tees with unreal designs. Last time we worked with Kamira, you guys absolutely blew up the flying whales design I mentioned. Damn you guys have good taste. And this time I wanted to mention a few other favorites of mine. Life on Mars, Red Tiger, Mythic Dragon, and Serpent Blade. They've also got polos, long sleeve shirts, sweatshirts, and hoodies too. Kamira was so impressed with the response last time that they've decided to extend our 10% off discount code SILF to January 15th. But make sure to shop before the holidays so you don't miss out on any of your favorite designs. Plus, there's free shipping on any orders over $60 in the US, so check out the link in the description and don't forget to let me know which products are your favorite in the comments. Shout out to the team at Kamira for sponsoring this video and let's get into the run. Ah, uh, Pokemon Heart Gold, perhaps the greatest remake to ever grace the Pokemon franchise. Let's start off by... Ooh. Man, can I just begin a Pokemon game without getting thudded into just one time? No apology either, huh? That little sh** is on my radar. In Elm's Lab, I decided to pick Cyndaquil as our starter. Not only is it usually my least picked starter, but it will also give our rival Totodile arguably the biggest threat for us. After our mom talks about how easy a phone is to use, wow, what a revolutionary concept, it's time to head out on our journey. We quickly arrive in Cherry Grove, where we're given a tour brought to you by Adderall. Lots and lots of Adderall. The weird thing is, this guy mentions how we don't have running shoes, so we won't be able to keep up with him, and then he proceeds to give us running shoes after the tour is over. What the f- Getting closer to Mr. Pokemon's house, we're blocked off by this epic battle occurring, and damn, those battle animations are even better than- Alright, nope. No, nope, not gonna go there. In his house, we're given the mystery egg, and for a split second, I thought it was Manaphy. I've been playing way too much BDSP. On our way back to the lab, we encounter Silver, who we smash into the ground. I reckon that's definitely gonna be the easiest battle we have with him, but we'll deal with the others when we get there. After the battle, he says, Do you want to know who I am? I'm gonna be the world's greatest Pokemon trainer. Wait, so that's not technically who you are, it's who you will be. Whoa, whoa, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. After Lyra gives us some Pokeballs, our run has officially begun, and you might be asking, Sylph, so where the hell are you gonna find a Rock-type Pokemon before the first gym? And thankfully, there is one singular answer to that question, the Dark Cave, which has an accessible entrance on Route 31. In here, we can find a trusty Geodude, which unfortunately is level 2. We catch it and nickname it Benatar, and she has a hasty nature, plus speed, and minus defense. Not super terrible, to be honest. The grind is brutal for this thing, as starting with a level 2 can be dangerous, but there are Caterpie nearby which give HP EVs, so I spend some time leveling up against them since they can't hurt us much. We eventually arrive in Violet City, the location of the first gym. But first, we have a really cool encounter in the city itself, thanks to good old Primo in the Pokemon Center. If you tell him the correct phrases, which are based on your trainer ID, he gives you Pokemon eggs, one of which is Slugma. According to online calculators, our phrase ended up being Magnet Pole Service Phone Recommended. Alrighty then. Welcome to the team, Mr. Egg. 
After picking up the Rock Smash TM, I decided to train against Hopip on Route 34 for a particular reason that we'll go over later, and during the process Benatar learned Rock Throw, a crucial move for us. Now the Sprout Tower is a terrifying place for us with 4 times super effective grass type Bell Sprout everywhere, but thankfully they usually have the physical Vine Whip move, so Benatar is able to safely make it through with Rock Throw, and the Bell Sprout do give attack EVs too. Toward the end where we have to battle the Elder, I was getting really scared about the level cap, but thankfully we're able to take him down successfully and stay just below level 14. Whew. With that, it's time for the first gym, the Violet City Gym, which allows us to skip the trainers, otherwise we would have passed the cap and this run would be over. The gym leader is Faulkner, a flying type trainer, so I'm imagining this should be pretty easy work. He leads with a Pidgey, and Benatar smashes it to death with one rock throw after being hit by Sand Attack. His second and final Pokemon is a Pidgeotto, and it hits us with Gust before Rock Throw brings it down to a quarter. Then it uses Roost, and we miss our next attack. We proceed to miss again, then we're brought below half before our next hit, but it survives on a sliver in the red before using Roost again. Oh god. I decide to hit it with Tackle for higher accuracy, we get hit by a critical hit down to just 6 HP, but thankfully our next Rock Throw does the job. Oh man, that was way closer than I was expecting. Sand attack is dangerous. On the way to our next encounter, I catch a Sentret for HMs and nickname her Groupie. Once evolved, Groupie helps us to get an amazing early game item, the Shell Bell, using Rock Smash, and we reach Union Cave. Now in here is our next encounter, but before we find it, our egg hatches to give us a Slugma. I nickname it Getty, and he also has a hasty plus speed and minus defense nature. Technically, we can't use it yet since it's a fire type, but it does evolve to a part rock type later on. After about 20 minutes of searching, we find our next official encounter, an Onyx, which is a 5% chance to find in Union Cave. We catch it in a vibrant pink heel ball and nickname it Jet, and Jet has a mild nature, plus special attack and minus defense. Pretty brutal, but we'll roll with it. <laughs> Jet, you're a little smaller than expected, but I guess you'll do. You can actually reach the basement here where we can pick up the Rock Tomb TM, and after a close encounter with a Slowpoke, we reach Azalea Town. One of the most peaceful and charming towns in the entire franchise, in my opinion. Well, at least it would be were it not for these rockets. In the Slowpoke well, Benatar and Jet perform amazingly well, easily handling Pokemon like Zubat and Rattata, as well as Coughings, which can poison us at most. For saving the town, Kurt awards us with... A Fastball. What a troll. I posted this on Twitter recently. In Heart Gold and Soul Silver, Fastballs only modify capture rates of Pokemon with a base speed stat of 100 or more. And not including legendaries, this modifier only applies to 6 Pokemon that are locally catchable within them in the main game. Thanks, Kurt. Real helpful, especially with a rock type team. It's time for the Azalea Gym, a bug type gym, and Jet is able to absolutely smash through all the trainers with ease, even the B drill that usually causes us some trouble here. In no time, we reach Gym Leader Bugsy, who I'm also feeling confident against, but after Faulkner, I'm being cautious. Bugsy leads with a Scyther, and I send out Benatar. He immediately goes for Leer, and then we miss our 4 times super effective same type attack bonus or stab rock throw. Are you kidding me? He then goes for U-turn, and oh damn that did a lot of damage. Thankfully, this pivots him into Metapod, and Rock Throw just barely doesn't KO. However, I take advantage of this by using Rock Polish and setting up, since he only has Tackle. We are low on health, but I get a few Rock Polishes off to raise our speed, take out Metapod, and now that we outspeed it, we can one-hit KO Scyther with Rock Throw. And it actually hit this time. Benatar tries to learn Self-Destruct upon level up, and, uh, yeah, great move for a Nuzlocke, isn't it? A switch into Jet is then able to handle the Kakuna with ease. Definitely could have gone better, but we got the badge Deathless. Up next, we have a massive problem and what could be a run ender. The battle with Silver at the Ilex Forest entrance. He now has a Croconaw with 4 times super effective water gun on both of our Pokemon, and keep in mind, in Gen 4, our sturdy ability only works on actual one hit KO moves like Sheer Cold and Fissure, not on moves in general that would KO us in one hit, so. This is bad. I take some time to think by heading to the Ruins of Alf, which has a few amazing things in store for us and they're all located within the Rock Smash Rocks. It takes a while since they're very rare, but here we can get none other than the Old Amber Fossil and also the Helix Fossil. We can't revive them quite yet, but we will need them later on. In the process, we also get a ton of shards, and they can be traded right here in Violet City for amazing berries, including citrus berries which are otherwise almost impossible to find in Johto and are great to have early in game. I theory crafted for like an hour for Silver's battle and came up with my best plan. Let's see if we have any hope. 
He leads with a Ghastly, and I lead with Benatar. Now, I was hoping the Ghastly would use anything but Curse, and it just goes for Spite. Amazing. That allows me to go for Rock Polish, and we should outspeed his whole team now. I then hit it with Rock Throw, which is a one-hit KO, but now in comes Croconaw. This is the reason why I trained up against Hophip and Caterpie like crazy, for the special defense and HP EVs, which I maxed out as much as possible. According to my calcs, this might allow us to survive a water gun. Now this is the key though, we need to hit two magnitudes in a row at 7 or higher, which means we have a 65% chance on each move, but we can't hit it below a third or else his torrent ability will activate on his water gun and destroy us. I go for magnitude, and we hit magnitude 8. Oh no, it looks like it might have brought it below a third, it goes for water gun, and we survive on 2 HP before our berry. I think it's just outside of Torrent. All we need is a 6 or higher now, an 85% chance, and we get a 9 to take it down. Alright, easy there, Benatar. We don't need overkill. Absolutely unreal. I thought this would be a white point, but our strategizing pulled off probably the only way that it could have been done, to be honest. Let's go. In the forest gate, this old lady tells us not to cause mischief, and... After rescuing the Farfetch'd, we get the Cut HM, and we can return back to the Cutmaster's house afterwards to get the Charcoal item, which should be a lot of help later on. Jet helps out the Kimono Girl near the end of the forest, and on Route 35, I really have to avoid all the trainers, as the level cap is very close, as I basically had to get right to it for Silver's battle. In the daycare, Lyra recommends that we talk to our Pokémon often, so I talk to Jet outside, and... Oh, she's holding an item. Let me see... Oh, you son of a... Great advice, Lyra. Goldenrod is upon us, and after picking up some TMs from the department store like Reflect and Light Screen, it's time for the next gym. I face as few trainers as possible, and Jet smashes through them with her resistances. The third gym leader is an infamous one, Whitney, the normal trainer. Yet again, I'm feeling good as we have great typing in the early game, but I'm being careful. She leads with Clefairy, and I send out Jet since she outspeeds with a surprising 70 base speed. I hit her with Bind just to get guaranteed turn-by-turn -turn damage, and then she uses Metronome and gets 120 base power, 4 times super effective Seed Flare of all things, which absolutely decimates Jet immediately. I wanna cry. Why? Of all things, why that? Rest in peace, Jet. In comes Benatar, and here, I just have to hope for better luck. Aside from Metronome and Encore, Clefairy can't really do anything to us, so I use one Defense Curl and one Rock Polish before taking Clefairy out in two attacks. In comes the monster Miltank, which immediately flinches us with Stomp, but after our Defense Curl, it's not doing much. This is a brutal struggle, with us getting flinched and crit a few times, but our Citrus Berry saves us and we take her down with just 20 HP in the end. A terrible death of Jet, but we got the third badge. Our mom ended up calling us to tell us that she bought something with our money, and I was all excited since they can often be really good items, but it was Koba Berries, which weakens super effective flying-type moves. Thanks, Mom. The key to our next encounter, oddly enough, comes in the flower shop, where this girl gives us the squirt bottle. On the way to that encounter, Benatar hits level 22, where she tries to learn Rollout, and it took me a long time to decide, but I eventually replace Rock Throw with it. Let's hope it's a good choice. We also sneak around the backside of the National Park to get the Dig TM too. With that, it's time for our next encounter, the mysterious tree on Route 36, which is revealed to be none other than a Sudowoodo. Now, one thing I realized is that it has low kick of all moves, so capturing it was terrifying, with Benatar being brought to just 12 HP in the process. I nickname it Adler, and Adler has a relaxed nature, plus defense and minus speed. We quickly arrive in Ekertik City, the location of the next gym, and after rescuing the Kimono Girl, we're given the Surf HM. Now, we have a big problem again. In the Burn Tower, we have to face Silver before the gym, and I don't realistically see us beating him this time with an upgraded team. After thinking for a long time, an idea comes to mind. Route 38 is technically open west of Ekritik, so I head all the way to Olivine City where... Oh jeez, help me! Oh, thank god. Here, we can pick up the Good Rod, which just might save us. I travel all the way back to Cherry Grove on foot, and the water here has the highest chance of giving us our next encounter. Weird, I know, a rock-type encounter in the water, but it turns out to be a Corsola, a 10% chance to fish up here. I catch one and nickname it Hammett, and Hammett ends up having a docile nature, which is neutral. That works. After training him up, I'm feeling much better about this battle. 
Silver leads with a Ghastly, and I send out Adler. He hits us with Confuse right off the bat, but Adler makes it through to hit it with a Rock Throw, but it survives in the red. Thankfully, after a mean look, we snap out and take it down with another. In comes Croconaw, and, and now we have an answer to this thing as I switch into Hammett. With a combination of Surf, Rock Blast, and Recover, Hammett absolutely walls him and takes him down with only a third damage on him. From there, Magnemite is easily handled with a switch into Benatar with Magnitude, and the same goes for Zubat with Rock Throw. Amazing stuff. The Ecruteek Gym is upon us, and Hammett is a great option here, being able to smash most of the trainers with 95 base power Surf, getting special attack EVs from all of their Pokemon too. Along the way, Benatar also evolves into a Graveler, giving us some much needed bulk and power, and Adler also learns Faint Attack, but I fear for Morty it's still not enough. His team is terrifying for us, being able to outspeed us with Hypnosis and Dream Eater, Shadow Ball, Curse, Mean Look, ugh, it's just brutal. After a while of theory crafting, I decide to go for it with Hammett leading against his Ghastly. He hits us with Lick before Surf takes him out in one hit. Nice. In comes Gengar next though, but I had taught Hammett Light Screen, so after we get Mean Looked, I set it up. From here, he misses his 60% accuracy Hypnosis, and Surf does less than half. Shadow Ball then only does about a third with Light Screen up, and then I use Rock Blast, which brings him below half and gets rid of the Citrus Berry. Our Citrus Berry then activates after a Sucker Punch, and one more Surf does the job. In comes Haunter next, and it goes for Curse immediately, allowing one Surf to do the job, but we get hurt to below half. His final Haunter comes in next, so I switch into Adler as Nightshade does a quarter. He then uses Curse yet again, so one faint attack finishes him off. Light Screen combined with a Mist Hypnosis definitely saved us, as Sleep with Dream Eater would have been a nightmare. Literally. Now that we can use Surf, I head back to Cherry Grove to go out on the water and get the Mystic Water item to boost Hammett's water moves, and oddly enough, we can actually make it all the way to the Lake of Rage to pick up the amazing Choice Specs item just after the fourth badge. Pretty cool. After making our way through the Olivine Lighthouse, we arrive in Cianwood City where the next gym is, but before that we have another encounter here. What is with all of these city encounters? It's so weird, but it's so cool too. Now there is a gift shuckle here that we could grab, but we wouldn't be able to nickname it, so I decide to get our own. That's right, this is the only place in Johto where Shuckle can actually be found in Rock Smash Rocks. It's a 10% chance to find one, but eventually we do and catch it successfully. I nickname her Patty, and Patty has a relaxed nature, plus defense and minus speed, which is pretty ideal to be honest. Now Patty, I feel, will be a key for the Cianwood City Gym, a fighting type gym, as she's our only Pokemon not weak to fighting. However, I made a big mistake, forgetting Machop has Seismic Toss, which does damage based on HP, and Shuckle's HP stat is atrocious, and we locked ourselves into Bide. The first hit brings us to 26 HP, and the second literally brings us down to 1 HP before we can switch to safety. Oh man, that would have probably been the fastest we ever lost a new Pokemon. Later on, Patty redeems herself though, even taking on Pokemon like Hitmonlee with great success. The fifth gym leader is Chuck, who has super effective moves against our entire team, and this is looking bad. However, his only fighting type move is Focus Punch, which requires a hitless turn to charge, so if we can time our moves right, we might manage. He leads with Primeape, and I lead with Hammett, who I switched Light Screen out for Reflect on. Primeape goes for Double Team, what I was scared of since that would allow him to get Focus Punch off if we miss. After hitting with a Surf and then a Rock Blast to prevent healing, I set up Reflect as he just goes for Rock Slide and failed Focus Punches, so another Surf then takes him down. In comes the big threat, Poliwrath, and this is why Hammett was such a great idea. I know he won't use Surf, so I switch into Patty with her massive defenses, but he hits a Hypnosis of all things on the Switch. Oh no, that is not good. I can't switch now since he'll use Focus Punch, so I stay in, and he gets a crit on us down to just 13 HP. Oh man, this is going so badly. Our Citrus Berry helps us survive another, but we don't wake up on like three or four more turns and get slammed into the ground with a final attack. That was awful. Here, I send Hammett back out, and since it has Water Absorb, I'm stuck with using Rock Blast to prevent Focus Punch. It's a long exchange, and eventually he goes for Body Slam and gets Paralysis on his first one. Why is this happening to us? We survive Surf on just 12 HP, but I get one last Reflect up before I have to switch. I go into Adler, and he went for Surf of all things while a Corsola was out, but Adler just barely survives it on 21 HP. Our last hope is Benatar, who is four times weak to water. But he goes for Focus Punch on the switch, and it still does over half even with Reflect up. I think this is the end of the run.
I go for Magnitude, but he goes for Focus Punch. Interesting. He then uses Body Slam of all things, and I am very confused at this point, but Magnitude 8 just barely doesn't KO him. After his berry, I hit him again to a quarter, then Body Slam paralyzes right as I went for Rollout, thinking that he'd heal, and then he did. This is brutal. The moment he switches to Surf, we are toast, and we're paralyzed too. But miraculously, he keeps trying Focus Punch, and we got a full five rollouts on a row while paralyzed to take him out with one final attack after he healed yet again. There was insane luck on both sides there, but Patty was a really rough loss. She was going to be a big defensive core of our team. After curing Amphi with the medicine, we get a call from... Ba... Bao ba? Saying that the Safari Zone's open, which actually holds a new encounter for us. However, to get it to appear, we have to complete the mission of catching a Geodude in the area, which prompts him to have to wait a while to unlock the feature that we need, so we'll have to come back when he calls us. While grinding up for Jasmine, Benatar hits level 33 where she learns Earthquake, an unreal move for us and good timing too as we head to the Olivine Gym. Gym leader Jasmine is a Steel type trainer and although Steel is super effective against Rock, Benatar is a complete monster and smashes her Magnemite with a 4 times super effective stab 100 base power Earthquake after being hit by Sonic Boom from using Defense Curl on the first turn. In comes another monster, Steelix, and with a raised defense, I'm feeling okay. We hit it with Earthquake, and it doesn't even do half, then Iron Tail smashes us down to 24 HP. I'm forced to switch, so I go into Hammett, who gets taken down to 29 HP by another Iron Tail, but now we can outspeed and respond with a Surf for the KO. A switch back into Benatar handles her final Pokemon, a second Magnemite, which I knew would go for Thunderbolt against Corsola, so that's the sixth badge. Those two had some great pivoting. After encountering the Red Gyarados at the Lake of Rage, we can take the Red Scale from it to Mr. Pokemon to trade it for the XP share, which we can put on Getty, not only to finally level him up a bit, but also to avoid the level cap since it's even lower than Jasmine's was, and we are super close to it. In the Mahogany Rocket Hideout, we can pick up the Thief TM, which will be useful for getting type-boosting items off wild Pokemon, and Adler turns out to be a legend as he destroys almost everything Team Rocket has with coverage against Raticate, Magnemite, Zubat, you name it. Lance suggests that we murder all of the Electrodes after he just hyperbeamed a man, and I'm starting to wonder about his morals at this point. But with that, we've thwarted Team Rocket's plans. The Mahogany Gym is up next, an Ice Gym, and Hammond is amazing against the trainers, resisting Ice defensively and having super effective moves against them offensively. Before the Gym Leader though, ba ba Moby calls again, finally letting us know that the next challenge is ready. Now this allows us to change the biomes in the Safari Zone, finally unlocking the Mountain One. It is here that we can capture something amazing that most people only think is available in the post-game at Mount Silver, the Larvitar Line. This is incredibly risky though, as Nuzlocke rules only allow us one shot at this, but thankfully on the third Safari Ball we catch one successfully. I nickname him Cobain, and Cobain has a sassy plus special defense and minus speed nature, which is meh, but I noticed it already has the Rock Slide and Sandstorm moves, which are pretty great. Not to mention he is incredibly cute as a following Pokemon, I mean, just look at him. After some training, Cobain evolves into a beastly Pupitar, quite a cool middle stage evolution if you ask me. With that, it's time for the seventh gym leader, Price, the Ice Trainer. His team is scary for ours with water and ground types, but I have a bit of a plan. He leads with a seal, and I lead with our newly obtained Cobain. His seal has no water moves, and I figure I can change the weather with Sandstorm if he uses hail. I hit him with Rock Slide, and we actually flinch him so another does him in. That works too. In comes Dugong next, which has Aurora Beam, but I figure we can get a Sandstorm off, and we tank Aurora Beam with under half before we land it. We should be able to live another after our berry in the Sandstorm, so I go for Rock Slide, and we do on 23 HP before Rock Slide brings him into the red after Sandstorm damage. I know he's gonna heal here, so I go for another, and we got a crit to take him down. Nice. Cobain is a beast. His final Pokemon is a Piloswine, and I'm forced to switch, so I go into Hammond, but Resisted Ice Fang gets a crit, and then he uses Hail. Surf then does over half, his berry activates, then with the Hail damage, he uses Mud Bomb, and we survive on just 4 HP to take him down with our next Surf. Man, because he has the Snow Cloak ability, we could have missed a move too, so we were quite fortunate there. Fast forward to Goldenrod, where Team Rocket has taken over the radio tower, and... Ah, f*** it. We'll join him. Team Rocket outfit with a Pupitar? Now that's badass. Our next challenge is Petrol, who has his stupid exploding coughings and wheezings. 
This battle was nuts and basically involved us powering through with Adler, Hammett, Cobain, and Benatar because poison and lowered accuracy from smokescreen were brutal. But ultimately, Benatar's rollout combined with shell bell recovery from each hit was the answer, but our team was super hurt from that battle. In the underground comes another battle with Silver, this time with his team quite buffed up. He leads with Golbat and I send out Adler who was able to one-hit KO him with Rock Slide. His now fully evolved Feraligator comes in and I'm like, you know what? Adler's not four times weak to water, only regularly weak, so I hit him with one Rock Slide, afterwards we were brought to half, and then Hammett handled him with Ancient Power, with us being brought to just 22 HP in the end because of a crunch defense drop. From there, Magnemite and Sneasel were easy work for Benatar, and a switch into Cobain with Crunch made Haunter a piece of cake. Now looking ahead to our next battle, I was quite worried. But the answer came in the form of training up Getty like crazy to level 38 where he finally evolved into Meg Cargo. And with the rock type, that means we can finally use him and I'm not worried about his levels since it's doubtful we'll be using him in the next gym. He also learned Lava Plume which is a great 80 power fire move. The next rocket executive is Ariana, the reason why we needed Meg Cargo. Our box Intimidate doesn't hinder us and two Lava Plumes do the job with the charcoal item attached. Here was the big threat, Vile Plume, which could have destroyed our entire team with Mega Drain, but Getty provided a great answer to it. Murkrow was then a one hit with Ancient Power, with Getty only being brought to about half throughout the whole battle. The final Rocket Executive is Archer, who could be quite a threat, but I decided to put the choice specs on Hammett, who was then able to mow down his entire team with a hyper powered Surf, although Houndoom did bring us quite low with Bite. A journey through the ice path brings us to Blackthorn City, where the eighth and final gym is. Now looking ahead to the Kingdra that we have to face, I am petrified. Literally 4 out of 5 of our Pokemon are not just weak to water, but 4 times weak to it. Yikes. While thinking on it, I decide to commit to the grind at the game corner to 10,000 coins to get the Ice Beam TM, which I do eventually get and teach to Hammett for some good coverage. This helps immensely with the trainers themselves at the Blackthorn City Gym, as they are mostly Dragon Trainers after all, and the Never Melt Ice we picked up in the Ice Path was a great help. Upon arrival to Claire, I pursued more theory crafting, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized there is no way even Corsola can survive this battle. There's just too much of a load on him, even with Ice Beam now. Another half an hour of theory crafting, and I've realized my only option. Let's put it to the test. Claire leads with a Gyarados of all things, and I send out Getty the Meg Cargo. Now, I know this looks ridiculous, but hear me out. Her Gyarados doesn't actually have a water move. Dragon Rage for 40 HP damage is the most she has against us, and her Intimidate doesn't hurt him really. I go for Yawn after getting hit, and here's a crucial part of my plan. We get hit to 24 HP before our berry, and then I decide to just go for Amnesia for a reason you'll see shortly. Gyarados falls asleep, and now I switch into Benatar. Here, I go for Rock Polish to ensure that we outspeed her entire team, and then I go for Defense Curl as she stays asleep. Now, for those of you who don't know, Defense Curl actually doubles the power of rollout if used the turn directly beforehand, and Gyarados merely hits us with Dragon Rage before we hit it. Now, this is why I wasted a turn with Getty. It allows me to get two hits off on Gyarados, so by the time she sends out her next Pokemon, which ends up being Kingdra, we can outspeed it and smash it with a 240 base power move for the one-hit KO. Incredible. All we have to hope for now is no miss, and we don't miss on either Dragonair hitting the final one with a 960 base power stab move. What a way to round out the gyms. Let's go. Before getting the badge though, we have to pass the Dragon's Den test and... What is most important for raising Pokemon? Violence. Our next big challenge is the Kimono Girls, who you have to battle consecutively. I was really worried about this, but eventually realized that Adler is our best option. With insane coverage, especially for a rock type, we're able to take down Umbreon with Low Kick, Espeon with Priority Sucker Punch, switch to Benatar to take out Flareon with Earthquake, switch to Benatar for Jolteon too, then the final Kimono Girl has a Vaporeon which could absolutely destroy us, but I attached a Pasho Berry we got from our mom which weakens Surf's power so we can survive on 16 HP, Roxolite then does about two thirds, and then from there I can hit it with Priority Sucker Punch for the KO. Oof. After encountering the legendary Pokemon Ho-Oh, thanks to the centuries of work put in by the Kimono Girls and their ancestors, Getty just kills it with Ancient Power. Getty, the ultimate legendary slayer and dream destroyer. Uh, sorry ladies, I... Um, okay, bye! On our way through the Victory Road area, we pick up the Sandstorm TM and the Crucial Earthquake TM, and the whole time I didn't find our next encounter until I stopped and searched for it for like half an hour. A Rhyhorn, our final encounter before the Pokemon League, which is a 5% chance to find. 
I catch it and nickname it Joplin, and Joplin has a mild nature, plus special attack and minus defense, which is awful. At the end of Victory Road comes our final rival battle, and this one was very, very messy. My girlfriend ended up coming into the room to bring dinner, and I got distracted while eating, so I can't even tell you what happened here. All I know is that teaching Alder Woodhammer from the Blackthorn move relearner was crucial, as we could smash for Alligator down to a sliver and then outprioritize him with Sucker Punch on the next turn, getting rid of the biggest threat, and the rest of his team was all dealt with by using our usual coverage pivots, except this time we had Meg Cargo with Lava Plume to handle Magneton and Haunter while paralyzed, then Cobain could be switched in to deal with Kadabra and Golbat with Payback and Rock Slide respectively. With that, it's time for the Pokemon League. While training up for the League Cap, Joplin ends up evolving into a beastly Rhydon and also learns Stone Edge at level 45. After fulfilling all of our EVs, getting more type boosting items like the Black Belt and a few Hardstones, gathering final TMs and rare candies, etc., it's time for the Elite Four. The first Elite Four member is Will, the Psychic Trainer. He leads with Zatu, and I send out Adler. I had initially wanted to Sucker Punch it, but it kept using the non-attacking me first move, so I was like, okay, I'll just use Rock Slide, so even if he uses it again, he just hits us with a resisted move, but he did get a crit before we one-hit KO him. Slowbro comes out, and I switch into Hammett, who I taught the Shadow Ball TM to, and we get a crit this time for the one-hit KO. Jinx then puts us to sleep with Lovely Kiss, and after a couple Psychics, we're getting too low, so I switch into Adler to go for Sucker Punch after getting hit down to just 13 HP for the KO. Executor then comes out, which is a big threat for us, but thankfully we have Getty, who tanks Psychic with above half, so I can tank another down to just 2 HP, lower than I thought, before Flamethrower destroys it. His final Pokemon is another Zatu, which is handled by Rock Slide from Cobain with just under half. The second Elite Four member is former gym leader Koga, and honestly, Getty is a perfect counter to his entire team, taking down his first four Pokemon with Flamethrower being brought to just 24 HP while poisoned. His last Pokemon is Crobat though, so a switch into Joplin is a perfect answer as we decimate him with Stone Edge. Up next is Bruno, and well, normally he's a really easy Elite Four member, but this time I think he might be among the hardest. I see no way around his Machamp at all. It's just too powerful a Pokemon, not to mention his other fighting types which are all super effective against our entire team. I come up with my best strategy though and go for it. Bruno begins with Hitmontop, and I leave with Joplin, our most tank-like Pokemon. I was thinking he might go for Triple Kick, but my second consideration, Dig, is what he goes for, perfect as I went for Soft Sand Boosted Earthquake with double power now since he's underground to destroy him. A good start. In comes Hitmonlee next, and he just hits us with Swagger to increase our attack, but it confuses us. Dangerous, but Joplin gets an Earthquake off to take him down. His third Pokemon is Hitmonchan, and I know it's going to go for Ice Punch, so I switch into Hammett, who resisted. This gives me an opportunity to get a Reflect off, which we do after being hit by Thunder Punch to below half. With Reflect now up, I switch back into Joplin for the next Thunder Punch immunity, then Ice Punch hardly does anything, but freezes us on the first turn! Oh no! My entire plan is shot now. Joplin then doesn't thaw out until just 12 HP left after Reflect goes down, 4 moves in total, but then thaws out and smashes him with Earthquake. My greatest fear is realized though, as he sends in Machamp next. Oh no. I decide to switch into Adler after much thinking, and we survive on 43 HP, and then I use Protect to try and break down his 5 power points, but he went for Revenge instead. Ugh. I then just go for Sucker Punch for some damage before he takes Adler down with Cross Chop. This is bad. Here, I decide to send in our next best defensive Pokemon, which might survive one, but she doesn't as Crop Chop is a one-hit KO on Benatar somehow. Unreal power. This does give me a free switch at least, but everything could be destroyed from here. I send in Joplin again, thinking there's a small chance we outspeed at a higher level, and we do miraculously to take him down. His final Pokemon is Onyx, and a switch into Cobain gets the job done as we each wear each other down with Earthquake, but Cobain comes out on top. That was a brutal battle with two losses, and I'm not feeling so confident anymore. With just four Pokemon left, we move to the final Elite Four member, Karen. Her team is scary, but I have a good plan, I think. I attach the Black Belt on Joplin to boost the power of Hammer Arm, and the first just barely doesn't KO Umbreon. She heals, and then another brings her down to a sliver, and then she preemptively switches into Vileplume. Interesting. Thankfully, Getty is a great switch here and takes it out with Flamethrower. 
Gengar comes out next, and I know this thing has Focus Blast, but I send in Cobain, and she misses her first one, then hits her second, but we survive on just 5 HP before our berry to then respond with Crunch for the KO. Unreal. Her Houndoom is then handled by a switch into Hammett with Surf, and Murkrow goes down to a Power Gem. Then Umbreon gets KO'd by Surf after a couple misses due to double team with us below half. It's time for the final battle. The champion Lance the Dragon Master. With just four Pokemon left, I am not seeing a path to victory, but I'm gonna give it my best. He leads with Gyarados with Intimidate, so I lead with Hammett, our only choice. He hits us with Waterfall to nearly half, and then I set up Reflect before another brings us to below half, but our Citrus Berry helps. I then hit it with Power Gem to below half, and Warp Rot below half before another one KOs him. In comes one of his Dragonites next, and I know he's gonna send out the one with Thunder to counter us, so I switch into Joplin, and the prediction works. He then hits us with Dragon Rush for not much damage with Reflect Up, and Stone Edge is a one-hit KO. Another Dragonite comes out and smashes us with Blizzard, but I had attached a Yachi Berry on Joplin for just this reason, and we survived below half before KOing it with Stone Edge as well. His level 50 Dragonite now comes out, and this thing has Outrage, so I am terrified. Ultimately, I decide to try and stall out the Outrages by switching until it confuses itself, and Cobain survives the first one on just 5 HP before our berry, and then Getty survives the second on 36 HP, and he gets confused. With no choice left though, I stay in, and he hits himself in confusion so I get a yawn off, which I thought was our safest play. He hits himself in confusion again though, and Ancient Power does enough to take him down from there. In comes Aerodactyl next, and with our Pokemon weak, I'm not feeling too good about this, but I'm hoping he'll go for Rock Slide, but he doesn't as Joplin gets hit by Crunch. This might be the end. I have to stay in. He goes for Crunch again, but we survive on just 11 HP and smash him with Stone Edge for the KO. His final Pokemon is Charizard, and I figure our best bet is to switch in Hammett, and he went for Fire Fang, which is four times resisted. He outspeeds though, of course, and hits us with Dragon Claw, and Hammett tanks it in the red and wrecks him with a four times super effective Power Gem. Unbelievable. That worked out about as well as it could have, and our strategy paid off. Definitely felt good after that brutal freeze from Bruno. With the champion defeated, there's time for a bit of celebration, but not too much as our greatest challenge is yet to come. At the Olivine Harbor, we get the National Pokedex from Professor Oak and set off on our journey to Kanto on the SS Aqua. Our first stop is Vermilion City where we begin our gym leader battles, and the Kanto gym leaders at this point are relatively easy given that we're fully EV trained and whatnot, and the biggest challenge was probably Misty, but teaching Corsola Toxic was immensely helpful there. Eventually, we get to Pewter City, a key location for us as we can get two more encounters here using our fossils. First, we can revive the Old Amber to get an Aerodactyl, which I nicknamed Jimmy and who has a naive plus speed and minus special defense nature. Next is our Helix fossil, which allows us to revive Lord Helix himself, Ammonite, who I nicknamed Bonham and who has an impish plus defense and minus special attack nature, which is admittedly quite rough. While grinding up, Bonham eventually evolves into an Omastar, which is quite a cool Pokemon. Also, Aerodactyl looks so damn cool as a following Pokemon, it's unbelievable. Just had to point that out. These fossil Pokemon came in handy as Brock was handled by Omastar with the choice specs, obliterating everything with Surf, and Aerodactyl could then pick off his own Omastar with Earthquake. After the battle, we also had our final evolution as Cobain finally evolved into a beastly Tyranitar, which absolutely obliterated most things in its path. Our final destination is the perilous Mount Silver, in which we find the Expert Belt, an amazing item that boosts super effective moves by a further 30%. We also... uh... oops. Sorry to disturb you, I'll, I'll be moving on now. At the peak of the mountain stands the most powerful trainer in the two regions, the legendary trainer, Red. The ultimate showdown commences as Red sends out his trusty Pikachu. Now this is a huge key to all of this. I lead with Cobain, who has Sandstream, cancelling out the hail right away, which usually makes this battle incredibly tough. Not only that, but the weather is permanent in Gen 4 since it's from an ability and not a move, and Sandstorm increases the special defense of all rock Pokemon, meaning our entire team. Pikachu hits us way harder than expected with Iron Tail though before Earthquake is then a one-hit KO. Blastoise comes out next and I switch in Jimmy and he missed his Focus Blast, not that it would have done much. From here I start spamming Fly so that he gets hurt by Sandstorm each turn while we're up in the air, and another key with Sandstorm is that Blizzard is no longer 100% accuracy so it missed and Aerodactyl took him down unscathed. 
Lapras comes out next, and I switch in Bonham, who resists Blizzard, and then Choice Specs boosted Ancient Power brings it to the red before another takes it down after red heals it a couple times. Venusaur then comes in, so I switch in Getty, Giga Drain hits us hard, and then he uses Sleep Powder. Uh-oh. Giga Drain starts doing massive damage and is recovering all the Sandstorm chip damage too, but Getty wakes up just on time with 60 HP left and slams him with a charcoal boosted flamethrower for the KO. Charizard comes out next and Hammond is the perfect counter to it, taking it down with Power Gem only being brought to half in the process. Red's final Pokemon is Snorlax and I hit it with one Power Gem and get hit down to 56 HP and get the defense drop. I'm forced to switch, so I go into Joplin, and Crunch does little to us before Expert Belt Boosted Hammer Arm pulverizes him. We've done it. We beat the strongest trainer in the game in a hardcore Nuzlocke with only Rock types and Deathless too. That Sandstorm was the answer to everything, honestly. Tyranitar is a beast. Rock types are certainly tough to work with in certain situations, but overall that was a really fun and challenging time. If you had fun with the run and enjoyed the bonus red battle, don't forget to hit that subscribe button as it really does help a lot and grows our community. A huge thanks to my YouTube members and patrons who make these videos possible. If you'd like to support and get your name up here, the links are also down below. If you enjoyed, drop a like down below to help the video out and leave a comment letting me know what kind of run we should do next and I'll see you guys for our next challenge video.